Welcome back. You are listening to the Labor Forum here on WRFG 89.3 FM. And we have two tremendously important people in the studio uh, for the existence of WRFG. And we're going to be talking about somebody who had a real big impact on WRFG, but uh, more importantly, I guess, or, or more extensively, on the whole idea of people knowing about labor history and southern labor history in particular and that's Cliff Kuhn and so for those of you that either get the um, Atlanta Journal-Constitution today in fact it seemed kind of serendipitous that today the it was when the paper actually ran his obituary he did die um, several, uh, November, it was last week. Mm -hmm. He had a massive heart attack and this was a very hard for people who knew Cliff to even grasp because he was a very energetic, athletic, rode his bicycle to work every day at Georgia State. So just a little bit to say, we have in the studio Barbara Joy, who uh, was a early, 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 early <laughs> person right here at WRFG, helped found it actually with Harlan Joy back when we first went on air uh, in 1973. And then Abdul Rashid Manan, Manan. Right. I always want to say his name wrong, but Abdul, as everybody knows him here at the studio, who's been a WRFG on air and all around person since 1976. Seven. Seven. I gave you another I've, year. I visited. <laughs> right. So we want to thank both of you for coming on and we want to share some information and stories about Cliff. And one of the reasons we're doing this here on the Labor Forum, as we found out, we'd always thought that Gary Washington, when he started the Labor Forum, that this was the first program on WRFG, and the, obviously it's the longest running, but it turns out that Cliff Kuhn actually had a program on labor, so I'm told so uh, if uh, do either one of you want to express a little bit about how Cliff uh, played a role in the early, early, early days of WRFG? Well, I don't recall that particular ongoing program, but when I first saw Cliff um, come into the station, he, wa he could talk of nothing but the Farm Workers Union. I think he must have spent some time out on the West Coast. And that was uh, mostly what he shared with us and with the audience at the very beginning. So he's always had an interest in working people in the stories they tell. And his career as an oral historian and um, at, at one point administer of the, the uh, I believe, the Labor History Archive at Georgia State, really um, not only showed his, uh, his lifelong uh, interest in getting the, the stories of ordinary people, working people, out to the larger public, but also is really very appropriate, I think, very much, was very much in sync with what WRFG has always wanted to do. So Abdul, uh, you know, I asked you about your um, knowledge of Cliff. I, I guess for all our audience uh, who may not know more about him, he was an associate professor of history at Georgia State. He uh, was, a, as Barbara just mentioned, he actually became the head of the Oral History Association, which when it got headquartered here. Many people would know Cliff because he worked extensively for the 100 year anniversary of the 1906 race riot, which is an absolutely um, pivotal uh, event in Atlanta's history, which I would venture to say 99.9% .9 of the population know nothing about. And in fact, it's probably when I first myself uh, came to appreciate the extraordinary amount of work that Cliff had done in un or, or exposing and in, in uncovering the stories of people who were uh, so impacted by this racist riot uh, which took place in 1906 by some 10,000 uh, white men and boys rampaging through downtown Atlanta uh, 
beating and actually killing and lynching um, black residents of the city. And he did a monthly tour of the downtown sites. Five Points, Marta, uh, Marietta Street. The statue of Henry Grady. The statue of Henry Grady. And, and made this all come so relevant and alive to what was happening today in the city. How, in fact, politics and the, the, the actual physical uh, divisions that are here in the city. He did that every uh, month for, I think, close to nine years. And uh, it was an extraordinary effort on his part to actually make sure that people understood history. And as we were talking earlier, and we talk all the time here on the Labor Forum, you know, what has happened before helps formulate what is happening now. So, Abdul, with that as an intro, tell us a Cliff Kuhn story. Well, uh, <laughs> my uh, experience with Cliff came as he was working on uh, the Living Atlanta project. Uh, he and a couple of other writers, um, including Harlan Joy, Harlan Joy, who was director of the project, right, um, were constantly uh, pulling together information first, and 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 they were working tirelessly. I mean almost around the clock, because I never knew when I would see Cliff. I, Cliff might show up in the dead of night, uh, but he'd be, he'd be there first thing in the morning. And, and, and it was like, well, what is this project? You know, I, 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 didn't, uh, I didn't have the total concept of it initially because I hadn't seen uh, like a write-up of it. But as I would talk with Cliff, Cliff would begin to uh, uh, get excited just telling me about it, just telling me about some of the people that he, would, he was meeting uh, and telling me about the fact that he was going to get to interview this person, he was going to get to interview this next person, and, and after he would interview him, he was totally energized. He, he, it, was, it was like, wow, I, I, I could have talked to this person for more hours, but, but uh, unfortunately I had, to, I had to end the conversation at some point. And, and this, is, this is the kind of energy I got from him every day. Um, when we moved into this building, I was about to say about other writers, uh, 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 there's a gentleman by the name of George Mitchell who takes uh, photographs and, and writes and uh, produce records and stuff. Uh, he and Cliff used to be in the same office down the hall here. And um, uh, just listening to them discuss Everything from music to to uh, uh, cinema, it, it, it was it was just it was an experience. Yeah. And in fact, that project, which I'll tell you a little bit more about, was being uh, produced at my house uh, because at the time I was married to the person who got the grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, Harlan Joy, and so and I and I was able to do some some minor I was I played a minor role a little research and some some production of of the tapes, uh, transforming the the interviews into radio programs. It was a series of oh God, how many was it fifty it fifty seems? two fifty two one for each week yeah half hour programs um, I believe it was half hour maybe it was yeah. an hour it seemed like an hour <laughs> half hour programs on aspects of Atlanta history from in the twenties thirties and forties. Emphasis on race relations, but all over the map. Baseball, politics, the police force, women, business, um, you name it. A lot of material that was not in the history books then, and most, uh, much of it is not in the history books now. But there is a book, because, the uh, and for the video audience, I'm holding up this book. Um, Living Atlanta was made in, was transformed from, I think, about 80 interview tapes and the 50 programs that we made from them transformed into a very readable narrative about all these topics with photographs and so on um, mostly by Cliff with editing by Harlan and direction by Harlan and a lot of the research of course had been done by Bernard West uh, the black member of the team we can't leave him out so this book is still in print. I believe it came out in paperback. I've this is a hard, hardback one I just held up. You can probably, if not, still find it at the bookstores. Order it. It was produced by 
the University of Georgia Press published it, very respectable uh, press, and we're very, very proud of that, that legacy. In fact, the, the, the tapes of the programs were still given, are still given away from time to time as a premium for marathon uh, contributors, contributors to WRFG. And some spin-off projects included an incredible documentary on the race riot of 1906, which was outside of the time period of living in Atlanta, but they actually, Cliff and others managed to find folks, this is in the early 80s when these were produced, find folks who were still alive, who were there, who remembered, black and white folks, who remembered seeing the mobs, who visited a friend, in, a relative in jail perhaps, during when the black people who tried to defend themselves were being rounded, rounded up, uh, people who well, there were all kinds of, uh, one woman who, who as a child saw someone lynched from a lamppost outside her window. These interviews are still being used by historians and were very, very groundbreaking. Yeah, I wanted to, to comment on that. Uh, the WRG, you know, if you ever uh, read all of our accomplishments, we always list this one among many, many others. And I think it goes again to uh, the role of a community radio station and the idea that uh, people, ordinary people, working class people, poor people, the life experiences that they have are really the fabric of what makes a society. It's what, mm -hmm. and they also have the knowledge and the ideas and the solutions to many issues. And, and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois was here during that period and um, and many thousands of people fled this city. And it's really unknown how many people were killed because mm -hmm. many black families took their uh, deceased members with them. Uh, and it was a, as I said, it was a, a, an event that totally altered and, and um, molded uh, the way race relations and political decisions were made and who the power groups were. And Cliff raised that all the time when he did his tour. And I, I always encouraged people to take advantage of it. It happened for nine years. I know every person who ever went uh, will remember that tour and, mm -hmm. and what Cliff had to say. And it is, in fact, an incredible loss. That's that a great website also uh, that has uh, information that was launched uh, about the time of the uh, centennial. And it still has great information mm -hmm. about uh, uh, the, the riot, uh, about all of the d events that led up to it and how it was even st uh, uh, stirred up by the newspaper, the, the, the yeah. very paper that we have in front of us here, was what well, was part of it. Yeah. Uh, and and, and it, it gives great information on it. And it was a, actually it was a labor issue also, because there were many reasons why it, this, this particular mm -hmm. white riot, let's put it uh, bluntly, took place at that time. But one reason was there had been competition for jobs and, 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 and businesses and business uh, opportunities between black and white workers who were, at that time, you know, there wasn't a lot of cars like there are now. Everybody was living a lot and, and working a lot closer together towards the, the inner, what's now the inner city. And the, the mobs um, claimed to be going after ne'er-do-wells in the black community. Actually, they went after the more successful people who were working and mm -hmm. riding public transit and so forth. Yeah, tailors, barber shops. Yeah, uh, yeah. Restaurants. Uh, all restaurants, all kinds of people who had businesses, yes. Yeah, we could play. Uh, you want to play the first uh, minute? Oh. Um, or let's do, we not do have time for this. Let's, uh, uh, let's let uh, Christopher cue it up. I'll ask one more question because you have another book there. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cliff went on from his, well, well, he got his Ph.D., I believe, after the Living Atlanta Project. He, I don't know the title, but it, it was something to do with um, mill towns in Alabama, I believe, and he also contributed to a book about mill towns in the South. So again, continuing his interest in the lives of working people. And then he produced a marvelous book, all on his own, called Contesting the New South Order, the 1914-1915 Strike at Atlanta's Fulton Mills. That's the mill that's shut down now that was in Cabbage Town. And that's I now really, apartments. Yeah, that's in now condos. lofts, right, condos. 
I really recommend this book. It's, it's quite fascinating, based on a, a trove of documents that, that Cliff would, had uh, gained access to uh, about how... So, the, yeah. Christopher, you got that little piece. So this is from the actual Living Atlanta series. This is what you're going to hear, yes, the very beginning of the 1906 Race Riot uh, program. The program is made possible by a grant from the Committee for the Humanities in Georgia. I don't think it lasted long, but it was terrifying while it lasted. It was a terrible time in Atlanta. Everybody was just so scared. I was just so scared they were coming. Never forget it, as long as I live. It's just as vivid now as a picture in front of my face. The riot of 1906 was the worst outbreak of racial hostility Atlanta has ever experienced. It still raises many questions. Why did it happen? Who participated? What impact did it have on our city's development? This program will present recollections of the riot by eyewitnesses, both blacks and whites. But most important, we ask you whether Atlantans of the 1980s can benefit from a look backwards at such an unpleasant part of our past. Some survivors of the riot refuse to discuss what they saw, even 74 years later. They prefer to let sleeping dogs lie. But historians believe that progress requires an understanding of what we leave behind, where we are coming from. Many eyewitnesses agree. WRFG invites you to travel back with us to September 1906 and decide for yourself. So, um, so this whole series, as Barbara said, uh, is available still on CD, and of course it's contained in the printed word in the book that's called Living Atlanta. And uh, we want to move on a little bit about Cliff, uh, because not only did he produce this incredible series along with others here at WRFG, but he also was board president and had other roles here at the station. And uh, I wanted to see if either of you wanted to comment any more about how Cliff, uh, the importance that he had as a actual participant in the, I don't know, one of administration. Well, uh, I, and development of this of this station, which has now lasted 42 plus years. One of the things that I can remember um, working with Cliff on for the longest period of time was uh, the program committee. Uh, I was on a program committee, and it was um, um, a committee of about eight people, I guess, day eight or nine. Uh, nine was probably mm -hmm. the, the odd number that we needed, and. Um, one of the things that took place while uh, this particular committee was meeting was um, changing programming from uh, uh, patchwork programming to uh, strips of programs, which, uh, which is the way we are now. What I mean by uh, patchwork, patchwork programming was every day you would get something different at any given time. So it was virtually impossible for you to tune in and expect to hear what you heard yesterday. Uh, the strip programming is what we have now where you have um, uh, programs like uh, uh, Good Morning Blues every morning, uh, Global Drum Beat every afternoon. Public affairs certain times. Exactly, exactly. So. Um, Cliff was, uh, uh, I think, where he was chair, uh, the late Faye Bellamy Powell was also chair of that committee. This, this process took place over about a four-year period because it was, um, there was a lot of... Um, contention. <laughs> Is that a kind word? Contention. Right. Resistance. Contention, resistance. <laughs> resistance. We depend and on the goodwill of volunteers. <laughs> when they get riled up, it's not so easy yet. <laughs> And, and a lot of fights. <laughs> <laughs> to be blunt. <laughs> and Cliff uh, was a good referee. He, uh, he could definitely, uh, uh, he, could, he could play devil's advocate, uh, but he could also uh, point up the, the good uh, parts of whatever it was that you were discussing about, uh, about why this should happen or why it shouldn't happen. Uh, and it took... Uh, someone like that to uh, chair that committee. 
because, as I said, this was a long drawn out issue. It did not happen overnight. It, it was uh, mm -hmm. it was something that we we wrestled with for years, literally years, uh, before we made those changes. Yes, he was. Um, see, he was board president for a while too, and uh, treasurer at one point in the late eighties. I remember. Well, this is kind. Of, might sound like ancient history, but. Those of us who shepherded the station through the, those years really appreciate people like that who are so dedicated as to come to endless meetings. <laughs> and they're not, I mean, I don't want to discourage anyone from volunteering. <laughs> but, you know, you know how it is when, when you're doing something like this that has only a couple people on paid staff. You have to put in a lot of time to talk things through and make sure that they, they work out okay. Well, so I have to say, I know from reading the obituary that was in the newspaper, there were numerous uh, very uh, laudatory comments and, and articles that were put on the internet in the days right after his death. I learned more about him as well. I, I wasn't aware that he had, was doing this monthly program on WABE on history. Mm -hmm. um, I did, and so I never even knew it was happening um, since yeah. I only listened to WRFG. So, <laughs> I, I, but I heard they were excellent programs. Yes, yes, I've, I've heard many of them, and uh, he. I wish they were on our, our stage. Mm -hmm. But he uh, really contributed a great deal because some of the official histories of the, of the city are not real entertaining or informative. I must say, uh, and but Cliff knew how to make them like that and, and he just was an excellent radio voice for some of the more some of the, the, the amazing things that have gone on in this city. I, I had a question about a headline I saw that um, he was Atlanta's greatest listener. And what were the qualities personally that made him a good oral historian in order to get those stories? Well, uh, imagine this. Uh, when they did they Live in Atlanta, um, many of those people were in their 90s. And they um, uh, were trying to, uh, uh, they, they were asked questions about a specific thing, perhaps. But they might stray from <laughs> those specific things while, while answering that question. Um, but I, I listened to some of the raw tapes because I didn't go on all of the interviews with Cliff when, when um, you know, when, when they were doing the interviews. But I listened to some of the raw tape uh, where, where he was able to listen to them closely enough to find out what it was that their concern was about what they were saying and steer them towards what it was that... Uh, he was trying to uh, get to come out, and uh, you you really have to listen to be able to do that. To mm -hmm. connect on a heart level, it sounds mm -hmm. like exactly, exactly, and that's that that is the type of listener he was. He, um, you would say something and 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 you forgot you said it, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and he'd bring it back just the way you said it, and would add something uh, to the conversation. Uh, uh, and and as I said. I, I learned a lot more about that when I was on the committee, on the program committee, because, uh, as I said, four years at least we, we worked on that, and uh, and there was all kinds of information passed back and forth and back and forth and all kinds of uh, emotions and, and so forth, and and he, he, could, he could listen to it and, and pull out the best part of it and then read it back to you. You want to say something, Barbara? Uh, about the I also, quality of listening? Well, um, no, I remember he, when he was learning to do that, you know. <laughs> uh, and Harlan was working with him, and, and it, it wasn't easy doing it for radio as well as for the usual research purposes that historians have to write a book or something or an article. You had to worry about dogs barking and radiators hissing and traffic noises and people coughing and uh, children running back and forth and all this kind of stuff he had to deal with as well as evoking the spirit of the person's recollections and making them at ease and uh, it, w it was really quite a challenge and, and he he did a very good job as did the other researcher and uh, it and the book I think is just marvelous I, again I highly recommend it <laughs>
In our, our half hour, I said it would fly by when we were talking about Cliff, and I uh, believe that there's going to be a, a public memorial service for him where many, many of his students and colleagues, and of course those of us here from WRFG, and all, he, he coached soccer. I mean, there was just an endless number of ways that Cliff Kuhn uh, impacted the people around him. And there will be, I believe, a very uh, heartfelt and touching uh, service where folks will be able to get a chance to expound, to tell the anecdotes, to laugh and to cry together. And that date has not yet been uh, selected. He is survived by his wife, mm -hmm. uh, Kathy, and two sons, and, um, and his mother and some other family, and of course his family here at WRFG and at Georgia State and all the other associations that Cliff had. Mm -hmm. I want to thank uh, Abdul and Barbara for bringing Cliff alive to us here on well, this program thank today. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's good to talk about it. And uh, we will be back again next Monday. And in closing, I always make sure that you're aware that we have a website, wrfglaborforum.org. You can like us on our Facebook page. We have a Twitter account. And of course, the Labor Forum YouTube channel, where you'd be able to watch this interview that we just had with Barbara and Abdul, and catch all the other past episodes of uh, the Labor Forum over the last many, many months. I want to thank Christopher and Ozzy for being our engineering and video staff, and we look forward to you tuning in again next Monday, 4 to 5, here at WRFG 89.3 FM. Thank you and bye.